Anyway, a second uh, word of welcome to all of you to uh, our uh, February uh, Design Conversations uh, presentation sponsored by the Vignelli Center and uh, generously underwritten by the Daily Brand like right Consulting now because our class is, uh, just in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, we're most pleased to um, have you here and uh, we, have, we have quite an evening ahead. <laughs> Quite a, quite a productive visit by our guest. Uh, I'm going to just say a few words here and then I'm going to, as usual, toss the microphone to my, uh, my esteemed colleague, Josh Owen. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, the Vignelli Center is uh, celebrating this year its 10th anniversary. And it was 10 years ago that in this very room we, uh, we dedicated the Vignelli Center. And uh, so we're having a whole series of events uh, this year uh, to celebrate that. And uh, this uh, uh, event tonight is really part of that. Our agenda tonight is going to be that uh, we're going to have um, uh, Gary's talk shortly. And then uh, we're going to have a reception in the back. I hope you all stay for that. And then uh, on the second level of the Vignelli Center, we're going to be have the Gary Hustwood a photo exhibit of Vignelli photographs. So we invite you to stay for the talk, stay for the food, and then go upstairs for the, um, for the exhibit. Uh, you'll notice that there's mixed in the crowd at least uh, three uh, very attractive young women with Vignelli t-shirts on, and their job tonight is to help all of you go from here to the exhibit. Okay, in case you're uh, confused. So we welcome you all, and uh, the other uh, two announcements, kind of. Uh, some of you may be interested in purchasing a copy of Gary Hustwood's uh, photograph book of the uh, of Vignelli. And uh, if you're interested in that, I think Josh may say a few more words about it, but uh, you can make arrangements over at the desk for, for that. Uh, and, Gary will sign the book. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 in this very spot, we're going to be having an opportunity for the RIT premiere of another Gary Hustlet production. And this is a documentary video that we did on the great uh, German designer Dieter Rams. So you're all, all welcome to come back tomorrow morning for, for more exciting uh, Gary Hustlet work. <laughs> So with all of this in mind, uh, I'd like to now uh, pass my, the uh, mic over to my colleague Josh to uh, introduce our guest. Welcome everyone. Very exciting evening we have on our hands tonight as Roger uh, <coughs> illustrated for you. Um, so I do hope that you'll all stay for the extent of the festivities. Um, as I've said before, uh, design can be thought of as a sort of benevolent virus. <laughs> Once circulating through the body, it changes everything about the designer's worldview. Part technologist, part artist, and part visionary, the designer operates on any matter of worthy problem, indiscriminate in the medium in which it is delivered, but deliberate in approach. Outcomes of our design problem solving take appropriate forms, from objects to systems, cities to stories. This infection of ours blurs our focus so that we see all these areas as the same. They simply exist at different scales and with different programs. We approach them all with the same applied process, as the Vignellis would have told us, design is one. I suppose I'm preaching to the choir when I say that many of us here have become infected with this design virus, Gary Hustwood certainly has. When he and I first met, we discovered we shared a mutual passion for music and guitars. When we began to talk further about it, Gary said to me jokingly, oh yeah, it's a sickness. <laughs> so I knew exactly what he meant. <laughs> Gary Hustwood is a busy guy. He's an independent filmmaker and photographer based in New York, who's produced 13 feature documentaries, including the award-winning I Am Trying to Break Your Heart about the band Wilco, 
Odd Sack, an experimental feature film by the band Animal Collective, and Mavis, the HBO documentary about gospel soul music legend, Mavis Staples. Gary worked with punk label SST Records in the late 80s, releasing the music of bands like Black Flag, Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Jr. He ran independent book publishing house Incommunicado Press during the 90s, was VP of the media website Salon.com in 2000, and started the indie DVD label Plexifilm in 2001. Through Plexifilm, Gary released over 40 films theatrically and uh, on home video, including work by the uh, Micellus Brothers um, and others, including Warhol and David Byrne. In 2007, he made his directorial debut with the film Helvetica, the wor world's first feature-length documentary about graphic design and photography. The film marked the beginning of the design film trilogy with Objectified about industrial design, product design following in, in 2009, and Urbanized about the design of cities in 2011. The films have been broadcast on PBS, BBC, HBO, and television outlets in 20 countries and have been screened in over 300 cities worldwide. Workplace, a documentary project about the future of the office, was commissioned for the 2016 Dennis Biennale of Architecture. His most recent film, Rams, about German design legend Dieter Rams, with original music by Brian Eno, was released in fall 2018, and we'll be watching it with Gary tomorrow here, so please come at 9.30. Gary's films have screened at Sundance Film Festival, South by Southwest Film Festival, Toronto International Film Festival, among others. <laughs> He is nominated for an Independent Spirit Award for Helvetica, he has served on the grand juries of Sundance Film Festival, the IFP Gotham Awards, and the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. He was named one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company. He is a member of the documentary branch of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. He has a long resume, as you can tell. <laughs> His film, I'm getting there. His film and photographic work has been included in exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Smithsonian, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, Design Museum London, Venice Biennale, Paul Kasman Gallery in New York, Atlanta Contemporary Art Center, Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York, the Colette Paris, uh, Gallery in Paris, among others. In 2016, Gary launched Scenic, a virtual reality content studio focusing on nonfiction VR work. The latest VR documentary collaboration with film maker Sam Green, This Is What the Future Looked Like, explores the work and legacy of futurist architecture, uh, architect Buckminster Fuller. He is also obsessed with guitars and is a partner in the boutique guitar company Cole Guitars. So, I think I've gotten through it. Gary said, oh, you don't have to read all that. I said, yes, I do. You're an impressive guy. And it's important God. that we all understand. It's embarrassing. So it's embarrassing. very embarrassing. Please join me in welcoming the very accomplished and also very humble Gary this <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Josh and Roger and Wendy and everyone here at the center for, um, for having me. Uh, it's a real honor. I was here in 2007 to show um, Helvetica, but I haven't been back since. And it's amazing how much um, has changed since then. And to be in this space that is so infused with the Vignelli's spirit and work is, um, is incredible. So thanks so much. And thank you all for coming out and, and being part of this. Um, so, I'm a filmmaker, and um, I live in Brooklyn, and as Josh told you, I've made a few documentaries about, um, about design, but I didn't start out having any desire to be a filmmaker, um, which some people, I think, find interesting, and like, I, I didn't go to film school, I had just no intention of doing it. But, um, I really just wanted to watch a film about fonts in 2005, and it didn't exist. I was looking around. I was just really into graphic design and type, and I wanted to watch something, and, and there was nothing there. Um, so that made me just kind of really want to uh, 
turn this off, this off, um, to make it. And I kind of, you know, have this uh, kind of ethos, I think, of like, why doesn't this exist? That's been the driving thing uh, pretty much throughout my career, like everything I've done. Um, I, I think sometimes if you, if you think like this, if you're constantly thinking like, oh God, why doesn't this thing exist? I really want it, or I really want to go to this event, or see this movie, or wear this type of clothing, or anything, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. You might think you're frustrated, but you're not frustrated. That is like vision, you have a vision. And um, if you want something to exist, there are other people out there who, who also want that thing. Um, and you kind of just have to trust that and, and just try to make it. So um, you know, that's kind of how I've kind of gone about all these things, gotten into filmmaking and book publishing and everything I've done, it's been that same um, question. Like, why doesn't this exist? And it can't be that hard to make it happen. So when I was in college, all my friends were in um, punk rock bands. This is like the 1980s in Southern California. This is a black flag. And um, I played guitar, as Josh mentioned, but, um, but all my friends were better at it than I was. So they were all in these amazing bands, and I ended up kind of helping, like, oh, we'll put on a show or, you know, rent out a hotel ballroom and get a bunch of friends' bands together and play it. Um, it was very kind of DIY, uh, so I would, was helping them release records, or we didn't know how to, anything about releasing a record. Um, but, you know, we just, okay, well, let's figure it out. Where do we get the records pressed? And, you know, you just kind of go through the steps. Um, but it was this idea of, of doing something that, that we wanted, that our group of friends wanted. We wanted to have shows. People who booked clubs did not want us to play there. Um, so we were like, okay, well, let's just figure this out. We can have our own, like, make our own thing. So, um, so I, got, I ended up getting kicked out of college twice, which is, another story, but mostly because I was more interested in like working with my friends' bands than I was in school. And at that time, um, there wasn't a, like a lot of like, in, there wasn't like an independent music major or any kind of like music industry major. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I left school and ended up working at SST Records, which is like this legendary punk rock label um, that was in, in um, LA. and. For me, this idea of punk, it, I think a lot of people kind of associate it with uh, fashion or with a certain like look or hairstyle or whatever. Um, but for me, it really was about that kind of DIY aesthetic or, or that ethos of just like, you know, you don't rely on other people to do the things that you want to see done. You just have to do it yourself and figure it out and make it happen. So that to me is, is what punk rock is about. It, it, Experimental Jet Set, which are uh, these Dutch designers, have a long um, theory about how punk rock is actually just a, another modernist movement um, because there is this ethos of, or this idea of creating your own reality. Um, so it was a combination probably of this like, why doesn't this exist idea um, with this sort of DIY ethic that I kind of got from, from all the punk rock stuff. Um, that gave me the confidence to kind of do these things like filmmaking that I had never, um, didn't have any experience or business doing. I was always into fonts, um, like when I was in college and after, a friend of mine got one of the first Macintosh computers, uh, like, you know, the 128K Mac, the just ridiculously um, slow and tiny thing, but it had like that uh, Mac Draw program where you could just do little brick patterns and really bad bitmap fonts and stuff. So we were just like, would make like cassette, uh, you know, sleeves and stuff. And I, I didn't have any design um, or art background, but uh, suddenly I could like, oh, type something on and wow, it like printed out and it looked real. Um, so I kind of got into graphic design in a very self-taught way, um, but it ended up being part of all these projects that I was doing, bands, putting a record out and, and you know, me helping them design it or uh, making a flyer for a show or, or something like that. So graphic design ended up being this thread through a lot of things that I was doing. I wasn't like a professional graphic designer, but I got into typography just that way. I started publishing books, um, again, because there wasn't anything out there. I wrote a book called Releasing an Independent Record, which was about like starting your own record label. This is. 1989, pre-internet pre or pre-web. 
Um, and I had to lay it out. I couldn't pay a graphic designer, so yeah, figure out what leading and kerning and all this stuff was, um, and, and kind of really got into it. So fast forward to 2005, I'd worked at record labels. Um, I started this DVD label, Plexifilm, and started releasing um, different uh, films. Plexi for me was like really like a record label, but for, um, for movies. Uh, but then people would come to us with projects that were sort of mid-process and needed help finishing, the Wilco documentary being the first project that kind of came to us. And um, so I kind of got involved in like helping make these films and through producing or helping produce a few music docs, I kind of saw the process and how it worked and I was like, well, this is, doesn't seem that difficult. Um, and this is right around the time where I was like, why isn't there a, a documentary about type um, and graphic design? I just couldn't believe it. Uh, there was a lot of talk around then too, because Helvetica kind of had a resurgence and everybody was like, I hate it, I love it, and the whole thing back and forth. So I was like, okay, well that's kind of an interesting structure maybe to talk about type and the way it affect, impacts our lives. And I, again, I couldn't believe that, that no one had made this film before, like the whole history of graphic design and type and all these designers and students and like nobody had made like a cinematic kind of documentary about it. So, um, so I decided to do that. <laughs> again, with, I didn't really have any filmmaking experience, but I could kind of see the, the film in my head and I had watched other filmmakers kind of do it, so, um, so I, I dove in. Which brings me to Massimo Vignelli, because the first person I contacted about the movie was Massimo. Um, only because like, I didn't know any graphic designers and Massimo's email was on the website. It was Massimo at Vignelli.com. So I was like, this is great. Yeah, type up the thing. So I wrote him an email and this is also kind of a strategy for any project that you're going to do that involves like well-known people. Um, and I, I still do this today. So I'll, like that one, I sent out maybe four emails at once to Matthew Carter and a few famous designers and Massimo was, was one of them. And I always say like something like, uh, I'm talking with Massimo Vignelli, Matthew Carter and so and so. I don't say they, they, they're doing the film. I'm just like, I'm talking to them. But at least it gives the illusion that like, you actually have something going for you, which at that point I didn't. Into it. This is me at the birthplace of Helvetica, which is in Munchenstein in Switzerland, uh, where we kind of tracked down. It's outside of Basel. We had to use a lot of old um, type, type specimen sheets and find their old dress and find it now. It's, it's a preschool now. I don't know if you can tell, but it's like a, um, it's a big facility and very industrial. Uh, it was funny because when I first started getting into um, tracking down Helvetica and like the birth of it and everything, all these old designers or people who had worked with the foundry were kept talking about kilos. They're like, "Yeah, we did a lot of kilos of, of that," and I was like, "Kilos? Like, I mean, it's lead type. It actually weighed a lot, and they would measure it in kilograms. They would measure it in like we shipped 2,000 kilos of Helvetica to the United States." <laughs> Like that's how they measured it. Like if you wanted a font, you, you didn't just you know, download it or they didn't mail you something. They had to ship you a, on a pallet a ton of lead. Um, so it was amazing to see this facility was very much an industrial facility to smelt metal. Um, but yeah, here I am, I got a, like a satisfied look. This is right when we pulled up, I'm just, yes, I found, we found it, this is it, this is gonna be so great. Um, but actually what interested me most about the film and a big reason why I, um, I think it kind of got outside the design world and kind of crossed over, um, one part was it was at a time when I think more and more people were using digital type. Um, my mom suddenly had a, like a favorite font. Um, and it just, maybe 15 years before that, People didn't know what, how to, what fonts were. I mean, unless you were in the trade, you didn't know what uh, uh, typography was. You didn't know the names of fonts. But suddenly, like, more people were, were exposed to it. But um, there was something else that I, that I realized only after that I, I, um, I released the film. I'm gonna play the trailer really quick and then I'll um, we'll talk about it in a sec. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry. Um, so there's a thing that happens, and again, I, I, I figured this out afterwards. Like our brains are sort of programmed to um, figure out puzzles and uh, make connections and make discoveries. And when you see type on the screen, it's almost like this Where's Waldo kind of effect where we're looking for the letters. And then oh, there's a message there and there's context around it. And then the next screen, oh, there it is again. And it's almost like a game that you're we're playing. I mean, I, again, I was unintentionally playing it with the viewers. But it's, um, it's, it's this thing, your brain is, is programmed to do it. And once you get into doing it for 80 minutes in a film, when you walk out of the theater or walk out to do something else, your brain's still doing it. Like I'm looking at the NASA logo here, like, you know, designers, graphic designers, I think do this all the time. I think Eric Speakerman calls it typomania, where you can't even order off a menu unless you've identified the font that the menu is laid out in. Um, they're hyper aware of, of the type. But I think most people in their daily lives, non-designers, are not uh, until they kind of watch something like this and then they kind of, that, that, that virus, as Josh said, kind of got in their heads. Um, but it is something that uh, once we make those connections and find and solve the kind of the puzzle, I think it's, it makes us much more engaged uh, to a story when we figure it out uh, on, our, on our own. So that's kind of one of my takeaways from Helvetica was this idea of making it, and, and this is, goes beyond just filmmaking, it is about design and communication. It's making it a, a little bit of a game or a puzzle. You can engage an audience for whatever you're doing by having a little bit of that because it, it triggers something in, a, in us that we really need. I think we, we're, we're, again, evolutionary programmed to kind of do it. Um, and even if it, that, that kind of gamification of it is not obvious, it does add a level of interactivity into uh, a media, a linear media like a documentary film that's not thought of as being interactive. But there is that sort of intellectual interaction. Um, the other thing that, that, that I think is another takeaway for me both in kind of design and um, in filmmaking is this idea of, of showing, not telling. Um, I, I have a big issue with a lot of documentaries, which I think kind of overtell the story um, and are so fixated on avoiding confusion uh, that they um, just kind of hammer away and give like, too much story, basically. Um, and I, I try not to do that. I try to give enough information but leave space to let the viewer or the user or the audience sort of figure some aspect of it out themselves. You know, everything should not be completely obvious. There is a level of confusion that's like, okay. It kind of sets our brains to, oh, wow, this is uh, something, you know, I gotta figure this out or explore something. Um, and I think it's really important, again, um, in, in context, like where the emergency exits are here should not be confusing. It should be very clear. And I don't know if this is in Helvetica or not, but you get the idea. But there's other things that, you do want that, that interaction. You want that level of like uh, curiosity to engage the user or the audience's curiosity. And don't let it all out there, you know? Um, so Objectified was the next film I made, which is also for me like a why doesn't this exist situation. It was right after Helvetica came out. Um, also, I, like I'd never made a film before Helvetica, so I was like, wow, this filmmaking, is, this is fun. It's like, I mean, I get to explore stuff that I'm obsessed with and like get paid for it. This is great. Um, and Objectified was the next kind of extension of that. I'm like really into gadgets and, you know, tech. And this was like another case of well, who are the people that make this stuff and what are the decisions they're making and what about sustainability and, you know, kind of consumerism and all these kind of things that I was thinking about at the time. Um, so kind of dove right into making that like immediately after Helvetica came out. The, it's been 10 years now since, um, since Objectified was released or a little, a little over 10 years. And so the, the uh, original poster was a lot of the objects that we used, or which showed in the film or objects from the designers in the film. But this is also a case of really good um, graphic design because Michael Place, the designer who, um, who did it, 
when we were assembling all the objects, he asked me, well, what did you use to make the film? Like, what were the objects? And I was like, oh, we used a Panasonic camera and a tripod and this Macintosh and these hard drives. So he, he made uh, icons of those and put them in the thing. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. And I ended up actually changing the ending of the film to show all those objects at the very end of the movie um, based on his poster design. So I think it's the first time a poster ever actually influenced the film itself. Um, but for the 10th anniversary, we did another, one, another poster with uh, 10 new objects from the past decade that we in, put in there, swapped them out. See if you can find them. The guitar is pretty obvious. But. A big part of making Objectified for me was getting Johnny Ive from Apple. At that point, no one had been, he didn't do outside interviews, and they had never let anyone into the design lab um, to do any filming. But um, I had gone to Apple to show Helvetica, and as part of that, I got friendly with some of the graphic designers who were still in the, the, the team there, who are still friends. So I was like, hey, making this film, Johnny Ive, get me in. And uh, it took like six months to finally like have a phone call with him, and we talked for two hours or something, and then it took another six months just to get their corporate PR people to get in line to do the interview. So I showed up, and I'll, first of all, I'll just show you the uh, little clip from the, um, from the film. The big definition of who you are as a designer, it, it, it's, it's the way that you look at the world. And um, I guess it's one of the sort of curses of what you do is that you're constantly looking at something and thinking, why, why, why is it like that? Or why is it like that and not like this? And so in that sense, you're constantly designing. So a couple things about this that I think are interesting. So one, it's like, okay, yeah, the clean white background. It's interesting because Apple, after this, started a lot of their stuff got clean and white in the backgrounds. But um, what's really funny is like, this is what this actually looked like when we were filming the interview. <laughs> we were in like some like uh, cafeteria portion they weren't using and we just like kind of set this thing up. And Johnny is amazing, but the, his like handler was like, "All right, we got one hour. Here it is." Like, I'm like, "Are you bringing out some objects? We wanted to talk about the frame of this in the iPod or whatever the heck we were talking about." And they're like, "No, no objects." So it's like, "Here he is. Go. You got one hour. Great." So I'm like, oh, "You know what? It's fine. We're gonna get him. We get the interview. It's another view of that." Um, <laughs> which is so funny because like when you watch that clip, you don't expect that you're in some closet here, you know. Um, so anyway, so we did the thing, of course, at like minute 59, we were just killing it. Uh, Johnny is super engaged. We're like, talking about all this stuff. Boom, an hour, a handler shows up. All right, thank you very much. Wow, it's great, 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 great. So time passed, and like I did a teaser for the film, like a trailer for it before it had been released, and I just, as a courtesy, I was like, hey, you're, you're going to be in this little trailer. You know, do you want to watch it first? I just show you for a few seconds. And, you know, I'd send it to him. And, um, and he, he emailed back and he was like, yeah, it looks great. He's like, but everybody else in this thing is actually doing something. They're actually designing things. And I'm sitting here like smiling like an idiot. Like what, like what? I'm like, yeah, well, you guys, they only gave me an hour with you and there was no thing. He's like, come back, come back again. It's like, come back again and, and, we'll, and we'll, I'll, we'll bring you into the design lab. We'll get the stuff out. And I'm like, wow, like, like when? He's like, Monday. And this is like, this is like Friday. This is like Friday. I'm just like, boom, I'm there. I mean, I live in New York. We had to fly to Cupertino. Did the whole thing. Went out there. So then we went back out, and then they brought us in and they did the whole thing, uh, you know, showed stuff and everything. So, um, But it was also through Objectified that I met Dieter Rams. Um, this is Luke Geisbuehler, who has been the, the uh, director of photography on, um, on all three of the design films and, and I guess, on Rams. Um, and this is in 2008. We were, you know, again talking to a lot of. How many of you seen, have seen Objectified? Okay, so fair, fair amount. Available on iTunes and Amazon streaming. <laughs> so we only spent a day with him, um, but totally hit it off. He's amazing. He, he, it's so funny because he still talks about this day because other film crews had come in, and Dieter's house is like 
it's like a temple or something. It's like the inside of his mind, just like so ordered and structured and white and just like, um, and film crews had come in and like moved stuff around as film crews do and like scuffed up the floors and other things. So he was really, you know, um, wary of letting us into the house. But we came in like, we had a shoulder mounted camera. I did the sound. We didn't even have anybody else. We did, there was no lights. We used only natural lighting. And um, did the interview, so low impact, all our cases were in the car. He still talks about it to this day. He's like, oh, when they came, they didn't have anything, the gear, they blah, 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 they were so great. And that, that was really the reason that I think later he let me make a, a larger film about him, because um, we didn't like mess up his stuff. <laughs> so. so anyway, I got to spend an afternoon, Objectified came out, Dieter liked it, everybody was happy. Um, but many years later, I was like, this is probably in 2014, I was kind of like, well, I, I sort of assumed that somebody would be making a feature-length documentary about Dieter Rams, a German filmmaker maybe, or something like that. So I kind of asked like, uh, Mark Adams, who, works at, uh, who runs Vitsu, the company that releases Rams furniture and, and shelving designs, and he was like, no, he's like, no, Dieter does not want to do a film. He's, he's um, refused many times before. Um, and it's just not, he doesn't want to talk. He's done talking about this stuff. He's like, the books are out there. So I kind of took that as a challenge. Um, because my, like my, my, uh, my argument was that a film can do something that a book, and there's amazing books about Dieter and their incredible books about design period, but film does something that the books can't do. Um, and, and it can bring you into their world and, and kind of um, just give you a deeper sense of, I think, their passion or inspiration or, or process. Um, and I think the two work very much in, in um, concert with each other. Great, great books about design and films about design, um, which is why like, I'm still making films about design. I think there need to be more of them. Um, so anyway, I, I also was like, look, it's going to reach an audience that is not going to maybe buy this design book. They're going to see it on TV. It's going to get your ideas to the next generation of designers and consumers. And that's something that, that Dieter is very, very much focused on. So he, uh, he after a few months of, of me trying, he, he finally agreed. The thing that was fascinating was the Dieter in his, uh, in his backyard in uh, Kronberg, which is outside of uh, Frankfurt. So the other thing that was fascinating to me about Dieter was here's this designer. He's arguably one of the most influential designers alive. Um, I, you know, hundreds of products uh, from uh, Brown and, and Vitsu. Um, and he looks back at his career. He's 85 or he's a little older, a, little, a couple of years older now. But he regrets being a designer. Um, because he feels like he's contributed to this totally unsustainable system of throwaway products and consumer overkill. Um, so it, it's, I think he's very proud of the work that he's done and his teams did, did. but um, this whole idea of making something that's long lasting and uh, that you could fix if it, was, if it broke. Um, a lot of these kind of ideas that they, in the 1950s, very idealistically championed, are now just not, not the case. So, um, so he, again, he's got mixed feelings about, about it, especially all the sort of tech um, fetishism, I think, that's pretty prevalent now. And when Braun was making those beautiful white, you know, I, I, Apple-looking <laughs> products back then, I think he feels like he's part of that. Um, part of that continuum. Um, what's also interesting to me is like he's totally opted out of the digital world, like, uh, you know, intentionally. Like he doesn't have a computer, he doesn't have the internet, he doesn't have a smartphone. He has an Olivetti uh, typewriter, um, Valentine, a Satsas. And um, so if you email Dieter, you email his assistant manager, Britta, she prints out the email, brings it over to Dieter's house, Dieter will read the email and will type out a response on the typewriter, give it to Britta, Britta will scan it in a PDF and email you back the PDF. <laughs> Which is, I, that kind of, um, I, I, I wanna do that, I wanna, I wanna live like that. Um, 
But it made sense to me, and not, it's not that he's like a Luddite, but it made sense to me because his entire um, career has been about simplicity, about trying to simplify the user's experience, his own life, and digital tools, and the internet, <clears throat> and all this technology has definitely like increased our capabilities, but has it made our lives more simple? Can anybody say that yes, our lives are simpler because of the internet? No hands. So it makes sense to me. Um, Dieter, of course, has his 10 principles that everyone you know, knows and are st still, I guess, taught in industrial design colleges. Um, This is, I, I've got a couple thoughts about the 10 principles. One thing, Dieter says they were supposed to be uh, just guidelines at the time and were not gonna be set in stone. They were rules that his team had developed at Braun and these were uh, like an internal thing for them to kind of keep in mind. Um, they were not supposed to be like the, you know, Moses' tablets uh, engraved in stone and he, he assumed that they would change as the times changed and the technology changed people would adapt them and, and you know, um, and, and evolve them. Um, but they are still kind of taken as these like, this is the rule and you shall not, you know, be dishonest with your design or whatever. But I, like my thinking around it is um, what I've took from working with him and kind of thinking about these while I was making a film um, was less about the actual tenets of the principles, but more about having a set of principles for what you do as a designer, as a artist, as a filmmaker, whatever you're doing, actually trying to kind of write out what is important to you and what um, you think is good or bad and the kind of people that you wanna work with or not work with. Actually just try to write it out as an exercise. It's really hard. Um, you can change it too. Like I've started my like, you know, Gary's seven principles of good filmmaking or, or whatever. But um, it's, I think it's an interesting exercise just to try to actually like, what do you stand for? Like what, what do you stand for aesthetically or morally when it comes to your work and, and doing business or, you know, study, whatever it is, learning. You can have principles of your own. Um, but I did try to kind of apply these to making film. This is the, uh, the, our edit wall during the making of the film. And it still is very low tech. This is kind of how we do it. We just like throw all the different scenes and ideas up on the wall and just start, to start rearranging things. The edit took about a year on this film. Um, most documentaries are really made in the edit. Like I don't go into the films, this film or any of the films with some sort of uh, strategy or game plan. They're explorations for me. They're things I want to learn more about and I'm going to talk with a lot of different people and learn from them. And then I start seeing the connections as the years go by and I learn more about the subject matter. And then I start looking um, in the edit room for where these things start to overlap. And you can kind of make a story organically from all those pieces. So I don't try to put like a framework on it to start and then just fill in the blanks of, of what I think my thesis should be. Like, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. Like, when I start these things as like an engaged amateur, basically. And you find the story and then you kind of, it's easy to kind of see where things connect and what the topics that the designers who are on the front lines, what they want to talk about. And then I kind of craft the, a film that's hopefully like watchable from all that stuff. But, um, Circling back to the music part of this, music, it's how I kind of um, make sense of, of, of filmmaking. Like my, my background is kind of in music. I started help by helping produce music, a few music documentaries. I often think that my films are really music documentaries, but about design. Um, so the actual music is really, really important. I need the music. Um, and for this film, I think I shot for 18 months and I hadn't edited a frame. I just kept shooting and shooting and translating and that was a big thing because Dieter only wanted to do the interviews in German and I don't speak German. But I had some incredible German speaking friends who, and designers who helped, who helped with that. 
But um, I just couldn't figure out how I was going to put it all together. I'd also never done a film about one person. They'd been these big, you know, collages where I could kind of, you know, go from, from idea to idea. And, um, and somebody asked me, like, oh, well, who would your ideal, you know, soundtrack person for this be? And I was like, oh, Brian Eno. You know, that would be amazing. This simplicity thing, and I don't know, probably would be, he probably knows who Rams is, and that could be really interesting. And then my friend was like, oh, well, I know somebody at Warp, the label that releases his stuff. Maybe you should just like email his manager. So I'm like, OK. I'm just out of the blue, email his manager. Emailed right back. He was a big fan of Rams, and, like, and he wanted to do the, do the score. Um, so suddenly when I got the first Eno tracks, um, he sent me, I sent him like raw footage, and he just you know, used that as sort of an inspiration to kind of start writing and recording. And that process went on for about six months. But um, he doesn't score two pictures. Like I gave him a scene and said, put some you know, tinkly things behind this. Um, he just would just send me music, hours of music. And then I would just kind of figure out, oh, that could work for this scene or that scene. But um, uh, once I got his first few tracks, I'd, like, I'd listen, and it's, the whole film like, fell into place for me. The whole film made sense. And hopefully, have, 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 ugh, how many of you have seen Rams, the movie? Wow, oh, OK. Tomorrow, 9.30 AM, which is historic, because in the hundreds of film screenings that I've done over the past 15 years, that is the earliest I've ever done a film screening, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Get your coffee right back here. Make history with me. <laughs> But it all fell into place. And um, also what I think is fascinating about Eno is he doesn't um, necessarily like compose the music. He, a lot of the music that's in the film is generative, um, meaning he basically created a structure, uh, a software structure in which the music could com compose itself, basically. And this is just a very basic uh, definition of what generative art or music or whatever is. Um, I'll play you the trailer for Rams. It's got some of that generative music. But, um, but it is really about his whole thing with chance operations. And um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, he's, not, he's not composing something in a piano. He's basically putting in a set of constraints that every fifth note, there's an 80% chance that it could be a B flat or whatever. Um, and then that changes as those things. And he'll kind of spit something out and maybe like a bit of it and bring that in and resample that and just kind of builds it from that. Morning, 9:30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so when the Rams film came out uh, last year, the I had this whole dilemma of like, oh, are we people are, are going to release a DVD or is, like I'm like I haven't played DVDs in like years. 
Like, but there was all papers like, oh, I want something, I want a physical thing. I'm like, I made a kind of stand that I'm like, I'm not going to release any physical objects. Dieter's whole philosophy is about redundant products and why would you make a plastic thing to hold a digital file when you can just send the digital file, et cetera, et cetera. So when I got to the point where I was releasing it, um, I, told, uh, I told Britta, Dieter's manager, I'm like, I'm sticking with Ram's philosophy. We are, there will be no plastic discs. We are not going to release anything. And it's just going to be digital only. And she was like, wow, that, that's great. But Dieter's going to want a DVD. And I was like, <laughs> I said, wait a minute. <laughs> like, if Dieter, <laughs> I'm like, it must be OK then if, if Ram said. But I did something where I didn't want it to be another plastic case and you know, landfill um, material. So I ended up taking so many photographs over that three years. I was just kind of getting more and more into photography over the past 10 years. So I decided to do this beautiful little book uh, on recycled stock of some of the photos that I had taken during the process and kind of behind the scenes, but also portraits of, of Dieter. And you could get it just with a digital file, or you could get it with a disc. And I just did a kind of very limited run of, of, of those. But, um, the, but I love the format of a little square. This is it right here. Of a little square book. I don't know. I, I just kind of got into this idea. It's about the size of, of the disc. but. Um, and that made me kind of lead, lead back, as all things do, to Vignelli. Um, in 2013, before I'd started the Rams movie, or maybe just when I was starting it, um, I was getting more involved in still photography and trying to do portraits. And I kind of needed willing bodies to let me take pictures of them. So I emailed Massimo. We had, of course, stayed in contact after Helvetica. I had gone to um, Cape Town to design in da Daba with Massimo and Leila and had you know, seen them at design conferences and like, spent a lot of time with them. So I emailed him to say, hey, could I just come over and you know, just hang out for the day and take pictures of you guys? I don't, I don't really know what I'm going to do with it, but I just wanted to like, you know, take some photographs. And he was like, yes, of course, come over. So. Um, so I just spent a day with him. This is in May 2013, so about a year before, um, before he died. And at that point, I'm sure some people close to him knew, but he, he did not let on that he was ill in any way. And he was like totally engaged. And I just kind of spent the day in the house um, just kind of observing and also just taking pictures of the stuff. Like I'm fascinated by the things, these objects that we have or that someone like the Vignellis have in their homes, most of which, of course, they designed. You know, when I first went to meet Massimo when we did um, Helvetica in 2005, it was like, um, I keep everybody, oh, come into the kitchen, I'll make you an espresso. Oh, yeah. the, the crew, everybody just like was making everybody coffees. And of course, they designed the cups and, you know, the spoons and everything. And it was just like this um, world that they had created. Um, but also, it was very so much hospitality and so much um, so so interested in everybody. So anyway, I'm, I'm fascinated by that stuff, both the things that they designed and made, but also the things that they had on their bookshelves and everything. So I spent the day. I took like 400 photographs that day, and um, you know, Massimo and his sense of humor. Look at this. I can do like that. Oh. Um, Layla, at this point, as many of you know, she you know, kind of had, uh, went through um, Alzheimer's. And she had just kind of been kind of, uh, she was in engaged, but then there'd be times where she wasn't engaged. And, and, but still so incredible. And, so, and Massimo was still so proud of her. And so like, you know, um, uh, it was amazing to kind of be in that space with the two of them at that moment. So the photographs I took, I, I, I was just trying to kind of um, capture that, you know, capture their life together and their things and their work and their spirit, um, which is impossible to do with the camera in one day. But, um, but I, was, I was trying to just be sort of this fly on the wall and soak it up and, and, and make images. So um, part of those images are what makes up the um, exhibit upstairs. It's been really amazing working with, with Josh and everyone here. Um, there's something about seeing the images of the Vignellis in that space with their furniture and, and 
it kind of humanizes it in a way. Um, and you get to kind of also see the connections between the things that are in their home and the things that are, that are on display here. So um, later on this evening, we'll all be going up. I hope you can all uh, come up and see it um, for yourselves. And then this is a few of the photos. And then I, I did another, oh, getting back to the square book thing. I love that square format. So. <laughs> Um, so I was like, oh, that's perfect, those Vignelli photos. Like, I had no idea what I was going to do with the photos. Like, I took them, and they've been sitting on my hard drive for seven years. And I was like, oh, a little book. It'd be great. We could do it with the center. And so it, it all worked out, and I'm so, so pleased to have the... Uh, the uh, used to be your prop man. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you got a future in this, kid, just you know, handing, people, <laughs> handing people the props. Um, but it's so... Uh, amazing to, to be here in the space and show the photographs to and talk to you all. Um, yeah, so uh, what's next? So I'm getting very close to announcing two new film projects. One is a design documentary, which will pull me back into the graphic design world after uh, whatever, since 2007 with Helvetica. Um, and the other is a really amazing um, project, a uh, music project that I'm super excited about. So, but I'll leave you with a couple quick thoughts before we um, break and also take some questions if you guys have them. But uh, I think a lot of my process, um, I mean, I've been independent since I was, again, kicked out of college. And I followed that path. Like, I have, I'm unemployable, basically, because I just want to do the projects that, that are important to me, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not a control freak, but um, I don't like gatekeepers. And, and a lot of what I've been doing is just like, you know, I fund the films myself, I release them myself, I go out and show them. It's very much like a band. I go on tour, like Rams, I did 50 cities, and just, you know, t-shirts and posters and the whole thing, um, because, it's all filmmaking to me. This is filmmaking to me. Coming and talking about the process is filmmaking. There's no, there's no delineation between I make this thing on screen and everything else, the business of it and the touring of it and, and all that stuff. Um, and I know that there is a, a lot of pressure, especially those of you who are students, to kind of like choose your track and get the degree and You've got your parents' expectations, and you've got your friends, what your friends are doing or not doing. But um, think of your career as this very long, cumulative process. Like, I didn't know I was going to be a filmmaker until I was 40, and I decided to make a movie about fonts. Like, I had zero desire to be a filmmaker. I liked films, but it wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, I didn't have that, you know, I'm not Tarantino. I didn't work in a video store and, you know eat, sleep, and breathe films. Um, but I followed the things that I was like, interested in and passionate about and, um, and let those kind of, you know, it's not a linear straight line. Um, there's a lot of different ways your career is going to go. So um, don't get too stressed out about like, the next few years. Um, think about the cumulative process. Like I, and also, I couldn't have made the film unless I'd had all these other little mini careers in music and book publishing and all this kind of stuff and toys with graphic design. It's not about what you're going to learn in a few years. It's what you're going to learn in 10 years or 20 years. And then it's going to all click for some project that you're going to do. So um, keep the faith. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you so much for having me. And cheers. Okay. Um, so we've got some time for questions if anybody has any. Shoot. Uh, what do you do when you're unmotivated or uninspired? What do I do when I'm unmotivated, uninspired? Well, I probably pick up a guitar and uh, <laughs> strum the guitar. Well, it's funny because, like, I don't. Um, I really, really believe that, like, creativity. It's about the state of mind that you're in, and it's about. Um, setting up a situation in which you can be creative. So I, playing guitar is a perfect example. It has nothing to do with design or filmmaking, but when I'm playing guitar or listening to music, I think of film ideas. Um, I'm also a really big fan of um, what I call uh, creative misinterpretation, 
which is basically when you see something and you're like, hey, what is that? Oh, you think it says something, but actually it doesn't say something. But the thing you thought it said was way more interesting. <laughs> like, I'll give you, this is a good example. Like, I was on the subway in New York City, and I saw somebody at the end of the car, it was a crowded subway in the morning, and somebody at the end of the subway car was reading a book that said, and the title was Scenic Youth. I was like, oh, scenic youth, that's fine. It's kind of like son a sonic youth play, but I mean, maybe it's like young photographers or something. Like, that's super cool. And the next stop, like, everybody got off, and I could see more clearly, and it actually just said sonic youth on the cover. <laughs> but, like, my thing was like, oh, scenic youth, that's cool, okay. And I, like, file it away in my little file of, like, things. But that idea of um, your interpretation of something is pro could be cooler than or more interesting than what it actually is. So be open to those little things because that's a way that your brain is kind of, that's a way to dig into your creative uh, uh, subconscious a little bit, even if it's just like a, uh, a mistake, basically. Mesmo always talked about ambiguity as being mm. important in this process. Mm. It seems like there's a parallel there with what you've been sharing with us to a certain extent. Yeah. The, the, Roger's saying that Massimo always talked about uh, ambiguity being a big part of his process, and I think that's true. Well, that's why I was talking about the, this idea, like confusion, sometimes a little bit of confusion is good because it, it fires you up. You don't want to overly confuse people, um, but a, a little bit is enough to kind of get you fired up. There's nothing I hate more than just like somebody laying it all out for me and going, well, well you know, What's the, where's the challenge? Like, you know, you just did all the work for me. I kind of want to do some of that work myself. And but, you'll remember. You'll and you'll remember it more. Yeah. You'll remember what it is if you have, a, have a, a role in kind of figuring it out. So, I mean, I try to do that. Like, I don't write a narration for the films that I have somebody read. Like, I'll just kind of string it together and, and trust that the, the viewer by the end of the film, they'll, they'll make the connections themselves. And it's, I think it's much more engaging and much more satisfying experience to do that, because at least for me. Because they're participating in your process. Because they're participating in the process. Yeah, and also there's a conversation there. I don't know, it's, it's again, people always kind of say, oh, well, like a documentary, it's not interactive. But there is like a level of like um, intellectual interaction happening. Like there's ideas that I am throwing out and I kind of feel like people will, Kind of use that to inform what the you know their understanding of the film, um, and and also draw on their own background and knowledge and experience and outlook to then make sense of the story themselves. You can watch the films and come away with a lot of different meaning. I think um, depending on who you are, are you a veteran who's been in the field for 57 years at RIT, ladies and gentlemen, Roger Remington. <laughs> Yeah, so you are going to have a much different um, take on one of my films than a, a freshman design student here. Um, but that's great. It's, like, it's all open to interpretation. And so don't close off that interpretation. Don't close off the possibility of different interpretations. Leave some ambiguity. Go ahead. Wait, you already, did you already ask? No, you didn't. Go. How did you feel whenever uh, Dieter said that he uh, didn't think that physical product should exist? What did I take away from when, design, when Dieter said that, he said that, he didn't say physical products shouldn't exist. Um, but I think that he just sees so much waste and so much just redundancy and so much useless products that have no business being made that it makes him sick. You know, I mean, he's been talking about since the 70s about sustainability and just about the like, you know, he's just got this amazing quote from this, um, design uh, forum that he, that he spoke at in New York in 76 about like how future generations would shudder at the amount of like crap that is going to be filling up the landfills. So he's been talking about this for a while. I don't think he feels like he's done enough to get that message out beyond the kind of very insular design world. I mean, especially now that it's so global and the communication is so global about these ideas. Um, and it, again, which I think is one of the reasons that he, that I finally convinced him to do the film is to kind of maybe help get that message out a little bit, a little bit further. Um, and it's definitely the subtext of the, of the documentary. But, you know, again, he's got, well, he doesn't have a lot of stuff in the house. As you've seen in the film, it's pretty sparse. 
Um, and there's very little art on the walls in his home, which is something that people ask me about too. Like, what does he have on the walls? It's pretty, well, you know, it's pretty minimal. But, um, but his, his ideas about uh, these physical objects should be in the background until they're needed. You know, it's not about the bookshelf, it's about the books that are on the bookshelf and what you want to put on there. So all this other stuff should kind of fade into the background. It's this idea of like neutral, neutrality. Um, and for him, the foreground is, is nature, is the bonsai, is the garden. I mean, he lives across the street from the Taunus Forest, which is like a massive forest. Like we would take walks um, in the film. But um, that's what is important to him. So everything else, it's like be as minimal as possible and be so that is, you know, foreground the stuff that's important to you. Go ahead. Oh, that's great. In India, like very few people know much about design and that's awesome. She started studying design after watch seeing Objectified in 2010. That's amazing. That's so cool because like I didn't even think it sounds so stupid and naive now, but when I released Helvetica, again, I wasn't in the design world and I I didn't even think about like the fact that that people that colleges and universities would use this as a to show it to students like it would be a teaching tool like I, I literally had zero idea because we've been making music films and people don't necessarily do that so it is this kind of I didn't make it with any thought about oh this is going to teach students about design I was I was just making films that like I wanted to watch about design but it's such a cool um, byproduct to like then have it be something and I've, I've especially now when I went on the Rams tour I've had a, a, a lot of people come up to me and have a similar thing the best the most interesting one not the best one but this um, a guy came up to me in Chicago when I was doing the Rams tour and he was like I was um, stationed in Afghanistan. I was in like a tent and a friend, like we had a DVD player, but and a friend from the States sent me this uh, DVD objectified and I had no idea what industrial design or product design was. And I watched that and I said, when I'm getting out of the service, I'm gonna go to design school. And he did and he's a practicing industrial designer in Chicago now. So that was the most extreme uh, version of the design virus uh, <laughs> getting out there. <laughs> Yes, sir. Did, uh, did Brahms know Vignelli or speak of Vignelli? Um, Dieter knew, knew Vignelli. He said they had only met one time on a jury of uh, design prize, I think in the 90s or the 80s or 90s. Um, but uh, so we didn't get like into a heavy, heavy discussion of it, but he definitely knew and, and appreciated Massimo oh, too. And Vignelli's daughter lives in Kronberg. Vignelli's daughter, Valentina, also lived in, in Kronberg, the city where Dieter is, for, for many years as well. So there's a kind of a tangential connection. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, so you've obviously interviewed an awful lot of people, a lot of very successful musicians, designers. Mm -hmm. Any kind of common threads, anything that you could say sort of in general about these people? Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is because it, it, it sort of, it, I realized it's like one of the reasons that I'm interested in design um, and that I probably just should have been a designer. It would have like saved me a lot of time and I just could have gone to design school instead of making all these movies. There's a good design school locally. That you really? <laughs> wow. Maybe, I, maybe it's not too late. I could, I could start. I could start now. Um, but there is a, it's kind of goes back to that why doesn't exist thing, but um, it's, it's this not being satisfied with things the way they are. And you talk to Johnny Ive, you talk to Dieter, you talk to anybody, even graphic designers, I think there's always this thing, this thing of like, oh, well that's, what the, what were they thinking? Like, they could have just done the hinge this way and whatever. There's always this analyzing something and trying to kind of make an incremental improvement or radically change something. Um, so that's, that's one thing I've seen um, as a character trait in a lot of designers that I also like see it's part of my character trait too, um, which is, again, explains maybe part of the reason that I'm, I'm obsessed with, with this stuff, so. I think that's probably a good place to leave it so that we can spend some time together with Gary during huh. the reception and see the exhibition upstairs. So thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you. Thank you.